What's up Brozones? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another Gravity Falls analysis style video. Today it's going to be a little bit random, a little bit all over the place because I've actually set up an agenda for what we're going to talk about in this video and, and, I've, and there's a lot of different points that I want to go through. I mean I know usually these are a little bit messy anyway because we kind of just go off of what's in my head at the time. But I think today, especially, we're just going to be going through quite a lot of random topics that I think is actually kind of connected in some way. But I think the big question that I want to try to, to answer today is who wrote the books that we're seeing in Gravity Falls? Because, because I feel like those are the centre of the series, right? And I feel like we have already been introduced to the character, 100%. We have to have been, otherwise it's it's a pretty bad show if they haven't... Like, like I think they do a lot of foreshadowing in Gravity Falls, so we must have seen this person already. So, I have a few suspects, and we're going to go through that in a minute, but I want to I, I wanna answer, or at least try to answer, who could have written that book. And I want to kind of go more into some of the kind of the real life lore of like bears and astrology and also we'll touch on the eye of providence because that's something I haven't mentioned yet um, and then there's a few more things such as the time traveling stuff that we were talking about uh, in my last reaction um, of course I, I haven't mentioned this yet but I am up to episode 11 in the series so pretty much halfway through and I think um, I think this is a really good point to do this sort of theorizing because when you're halfway through a series you can kind of almost tell where it's starting to go um, and you can also kind of figure out some mysteries but there's a, a lot that's going on that I don't fully understand yet and I want to get some somewhere with it. I want to make some theories, I want to make some more predictions like we did in that first ever analysis video and I cannot wait to get there. So let's begin. So if you know me you will know I love a good PowerPoint presentation classic absolutely classic it feels like i'm back in school again so i made a powerpoint presentation on who wrote the books uh, a gravity force discussion with ozone so first of all the the good thing to mention is what are these books so this book was found in episode number one by dipper he found this contraption within a fake tree and he pulled a switch and then it opened like a trapdoor and there was a book inside and it was book number three I believe it's actually called journal three or at least that's what it's called um, like the, the real life version is called journal three so we found the third book in, uh, in episode one of the series and then in episode number four of the series which was when we first met Gideon we found out at the end of that episode that Gideon holds book number two so that leads me to believe, and tell me if I'm completely, actually don't tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right here. If there's a book number three and there's a book number two, there just has to be a book number one. So I think another big question as well is who who has book number one? Um, but I, I don't know, I don't know if I can even answer that right now. Uh, maybe we'll get introduced to them later in the series, and I'm really hoping we do because that will that would be really cool. I think it's cool as well that we, that we go back to three, as in a triangle, three angles. Um, but yeah, who wrote the books? We don't know the author of these books, and I feel like that's the key to solving a lot of the mysteries in Gravity Falls. So, let's go on to my first suspect. <laughs> Flying cube animation. Okay, the first sus suspect is Grunkle Stan. So, this was my initial thought after the after watching the first ever episode and the reason is because there is something in the mystery shack that we don't know and that's why Gideon is so obsessed with going to the mystery shack and get, spiting Grand Stan and stuff like that like he's very against uh, the Pines family because there is something in the mystery shack that we haven't seen yet and it seems like a lot of the things happening are actually happening around the mystery shack and around Dipper and centered around Grunkle Stan etc. So it seems like there's more to Grunkle Stan, obviously do not trust Stan is something that we've heard multiple times in the series already and it seems like there's more to the mystery shack so it, it almost feels like maybe he either maybe he has the first book and we just haven't seen that yet uh, that that knowledge um, or 
he he may have written the books. Now, the reason I actually think this could be uh, debunked is because the the intro screen that we've looked at so many times now has a dis uh, has a has a code in it that says um, I, I forgot what the exact words are, but it's it's another form of do not trust Grandcore Stan, um, and and so it's almost like why would Stan write that um, unless he was like possessed or something but so I, I think that's probably a way to debunk that however I think it could still be a possibility in the grand scheme of things um, I think a, a low chance but a chance nevertheless um, because we know that Stan is sus in one way or another and we're gonna see how he is sus but I just don't know that yet and, and it could be because he's written these books um he does seem to have a, no a lot of knowledge about gravity falls and he does seem to be well he, he's like the owner of the mystery shack right so it's almost like he he has he looks into the mysteries and stuff like that i don't i don't know um let's go on to suspect number two blendin blandin so blendin was someone we got introduced to in episode number nine which was the time traveling pig episode. And I really liked that episode. Actually, it's probably my favorite episode so far. The thing that I find sus about Blendin Blandin, and by the way, I didn't piece together in that episode that his name is Blendin, as in blend in. Uh, I'm so stupid. Um, Blendin, he, he's a time traveler. So basically he, he can go back in time. He can go forward in time. Uh, and we saw that in the episode. We saw Dipper and Mabel go backwards and forwards in time multiple times. And we also saw blend in, uh, blend in with um, multiple backgrounds of the past, etc. And we're going to look into that um, later on in this video uh, more in depth. But uh, it's possible because he's a time traveler that he knows the secrets of the, the Mystery Shack and and just Gravity Falls in general, and so maybe he he made these journals. Um, it, it does seem, it kind of seems like a, a somewhat futuristic book. It, it's, it's also the fact that he, he, he works for like, I forgot what it's actually called, but it's, it's basically the TVA, the Gravity Falls Time Variance Authority, and we had like this big baby god, like maybe he worships Bill Cipher, again, have no idea who Bill Cipher is at this point in time, but I've, I've theorized that he's some sort of god, some sort of um, higher power. And so I feel like maybe he could be worshiping Bill and in doing so he has written these journals or something. I, I kind of see this as unlikely. I don't see Blendin having a major role in the series, especially when we've only been introduced to him in episode number nine. But it's interesting to think about, nevertheless. Um, I think maybe let's go on to suspect number three then. And that is Old Man Gucket, McGut McGucket. I've never said his name before, so I've, there you go, Old Man McGucket. So, McGucket, so he's an interesting character. We first got introduced to him in the second episode, which was the, uh, the Gobble Wonka. And we found out that he made this, this huge animatronic Gobble Wonka. Uh, even though there's a Gobble Wonka that actually exists below. Um, what, what was interesting about that is he built it and it, it was almost a direct replica of the Gobble Wonka. If you look in the episode, the Gobble Wonka actually looks like the robot Gobble Wonka. So it's kind of scary in that regard. And he seems like this crazy man, right? And, and everybody's like, oh, just don't worry, that, that guy's crazy. But I feel like there could be a plot twist where it's like, He's not actually crazy. He wrote these books. He knows everything about Gravity Falls. I mean, like, also there's the fact, there's the, the stereotype that he's he's an old man. He's he's very wise in some regard. He, he's crazy, but he's wise. Um, he built that robot. He's capable of doing mad things, like crazy things. And it seems like maybe he's had, like, he's got rips in his hat. He, he seems very worn. He's got like a bandage around his arm. It seems like he has had some adventures of his own and he has seen the depths of Gravity Falls. Now, this is the first suspect where I feel like this could actually 
like be true like i i feel i don't feel really confident because i feel like he's just kind of a throwaway character and someone that just keeps reappearing just because he's funny um but at the same time it it could it could definitely be a plot twist and i would love it if it is i think that that would be a great plot twist for this series um so that's quite interesting. Uh, I, in that episode about the Goblin Wonka, he said that he just wanted attention. He was like an old man and he had a family, but he wanted attention, more attention from them. He wanted his family to hang out with him more. Um, so maybe like all of, all of the stuff he did with the books and stuff was for attention, or maybe that's the reason he's crazy uh, because he's seen all these crazy things and it's made him mentally unstable. Don't know. Uh, I think there's a few theories there, and I think there's a few ways that could go. But I think Old Man McGucket could be a good shout for this this author. Let's move on to suspect number four, Quentin Trembley. So Quentin Trembley was the eight and a half president of the United States. He won the election because of a landslide, and <laughs> and he was just a crazy, crazy president. He was absolutely crazy, but he was the founder of Gravity Falls, okay? Just remember that. He's the founder of Gravity Falls, so maybe he's the founder of everything that happens in Gravity Falls in a way. Like, it's almost like a parallel, right? So he's, he is crazy, like, just like McGucket. Quentin Trembley is crazy, he had some crazy rules put in place, etc. But maybe that kind of reflected onto Gravity Falls itself, Maybe because he founded Gravity Falls, that made Gravity Falls crazy in a way. And, and all of these different mythical things and crazy magical stuff is happening in Gravity Falls. So I think that that's also a relatively good shout. Only thing is, will we see Quentin Trembley again? Will we hear about Quentin Trembley again? Maybe. Maybe. I think that we actually heard the name Trembly in the time travelling episode, and I did point it out um, in my uncut reaction. Uh, I don't know if I put it in the actual YouTube video, but we did hear the name Trembly when they were in the cart in the olden days. Um, so it, it could be, it could just be another like throwaway invention of Trembly, just like a cool Easter egg, but it also could be like that there could be more to Trembly that we don't know. And of course, the police seem to have known about Quentin Trembley and maybe the police know about the secrets and they know his true identity and the fact that he, he also made these books and etc. So I, I don't know. Um, I think that Quentin Trembley could also be a good shout. Um, I, think, I, I think probably the most reasonable option here is Quentin Trembley or Old Man with Gucket. Uh, or... Suspect number five, Waddles. So basically Waddles is a time traveling pig. And I think the thing to, to know about pigs is, yeah, I'm just playing with you. It It's it's not a pig. It's not a pig, I swear. But those are sort of my, my four or five, <laughs> I'd say probably four, four suspects for who could have written the book at the time. Please, please, please don't tell me, don't give me any clues or hints in the comments. I would love to work it out on my own and I would love to get the reveal on my own. I think that it's going to be a really big reveal when it comes. So I would love to have like a completely spoiler free reaction to that moment. And when it all clicks, it's gonna be magical. All right, so I'm actually gonna zoom in a little bit here. Um, this is my agenda, so I, I have it in my, uh, in my Excel uh, that, I, that I've been using recently. Uh, this is my agenda, and we just kind of crossed off who wrote the book, so fine. Um, so let's start with the start, Eye of Providence. So the reason this has come up uh, in my brain recently is because one day I was kind of sat thinking, just thinking about Gravity Falls, you know, watching paint dry basically, um, and I was thinking, I've seen, I swear like I've seen Egyptian mythology and ancient Egyptian texts and stuff like that with eye symbols like that like the Egyptians were obsessed with eyes and I don't know why and and I was like I, I actually remember having like a model pyramid in my room 
uh, when I was younger and it had an eye on it and I always wondered why it had an eye on it and so I thought you know I'm gonna look up why why are Egyptians so so obsessed with eyes so uh, let me let me actually show you so here's what I looked up actually pyramid with eye in the middle I looked this up and it comes up with the eye of providence or an all-seeing eye and okay look at this just look at this look that okay wait why why is it not opening okay there we go that that is bill cipher I, you probably can't see that i'm sorry this this is bill cipher 100 and and i also didn't even realize right I, obviously i live in the uk this is on the us dollar bill i think no no not the us dollar bill wait what bill is it on I don't know it's it's on some sort of money bill thing um and and so i saw this and i, I like i looked it up i saw this and i kind of stopped looking because i want to look more in in depth in this episode so let's have a look so i'm going to look on wikipedia on what the eye of providence actually is and what it means etc so the eye of providence or all-seeing eye is a symbol depicting an eye often enclosed in a triangle and surrounded by a ray of light or a halo intended to represent providence as the eye watches over the workers of mankind oh and it is the united states one dollar bill huh it's such a weird can i just say it's such a weird thing to have on a on a dollar bill is that not weird do you, do you guys not find that weird or is it just kind of like second nature to you? I want to hear from Americans to see, um, to hear what you think about that. Because that's such a weird thing to have on a, on a bill, is it not? Um, what does providence actually mean? Divine providence. In theology, divine providence or simply providence is God's intervention in the universe. The, the, the term divine providence is also used as a title of God. Okay. The distinction is usually made between general providence, which refers to God's continuous upholding of the existence and natural order of the universe, and special providence, which refers to God's extraordinary intervention in the life of people. Ha! Ha 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 ha! Okay. Uh, Latin divinus, meaning of God. Uh, oh, no, that's just, sorry, that's divine. Uh, providence comes from Latin providentia, meaning foresight or prudence. That makes sense, actually. Okay, so so what we're saying here and how this is related is obviously Bill Cipher is a triangle. It, it's literally this pyramid on the dollar bill, right? It's literally pyramid with an eye at the top, kind of cut off halfway through, and um, and so it was almost like Bill represents the eye of providence. And this does take place in the US as well, just saying. Um, it's almost like Bill is the Eye of Providence, AKA the God, the all-seeing God, the omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipotent. <laughs> oh wait, no, that's omnipotent. Never mind, I'm really stupid. He is the Eye. He, he is above all of the workers of mankind. He's watching over the workers of mankind. So that's interesting. That, that goes to my theory of Bill is a god, uh, and I think that's pretty set in stone at this point. Like we we haven't seen Bill at all, but I'm pretty sure he's a god. Like we're seeing a lot of different like we're seeing rituals, we're seeing like different things that that seem to be telling us that he's a god. And the fact that we haven't seen him yet means he's yet to be summoned in a way. Uh, but maybe he's behind everything that happens in Gravity Falls. And and I will say one of the suspects I was gonna put on there was Bill Cipher himself, but it, it just feels, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right for Bill Cipher to write this book almost about himself, you know? So I, I think I think it's maybe someone who is a follower of Bill Cipher and um, and wants to, to write about him and, st and all of the crazy things that he's connected to. I think this is really interesting and I can't believe that I didn't bring this up earlier because I, I've always known this was a thing. Um, uh, granted, I haven't ever looked into it, but I, I think that's very, very interesting. Oh yeah, just before I get rid of this one. Um, 
yeah, we, we did have a mention of hieroglyphics in episode number eight. Yes, eight. Uh, what was eight called? Irrational, irrational treasure. Um, we did get a mention very briefly of hieroglyphics. And obviously hieroglyphics is related to ancient Egypt, is related to all this pyramid and eye of providence imagery and stuff like that. Actually, does the eye of providence stem from Egypt? It probably doesn't actually. Oh, interesting. So, okay, so actually I'm gonna look up. Okay, so, okay, so, what I'm actually thinking of, I mean, I knew the Eye of Providence was a thing, and I've, I've actually seen the, the dollar bill before. What I was actually looking for was the Eye of Horus, which is a strictly, uh, th there it is, it is a strictly Egyptian, ancient Egyptian symbol uh, that, was, that was used, I think even in hieroglyphics it was used. Um, oh, for God's sake, Quora, I, okay. I'm wondering if this could also tie into it. Um, it. It's a symbol in ancient Egyptian religion that represents well-being, healing and protection. It derives from the mythical conflict between the god Horus with his rival Set, in which Set tore out or destroyed one or both of Horus's eyes and the eye was subsequently healed or returned to Horus with the assistance of another deity, deity sorry, <laughs> uh, such as Thoth, Thoth, uh, Osiris, afterlife yeah I, I don't think there's anything here i don't think obviously the eye of horus has um a very distinct pattern to it it has that kind of curl and this is the eye i was talking about that i saw on the model pyramid when i was younger so the eye of horus i think is its own thing and seeing as bill doesn't have this specific kind of pattern um of the eye of horus i, I don't think it's probably related but either way, I think the Eye of Providence is still um, very related and very much tells me that it's probably a god. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. All right, from ancient Egypt and the Eye of Providence to math. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm gonna get anywhere with this. I, I just wanna take a, a quick look at this. And so here it is, uh, I've got it open in Photoshop. Um, this was in episode number uh, nine, and this was the episode where obviously he was he was the time traveling episode where he was throwing the ball and it kept hitting Wendy in the face and it was really funny in that regard. But he then went out of his way to do all of this maths to find out the perfect trajectory of um, how how to throw the ball and make it so that it smashes the bottles but doesn't hit. Wendy in the face uh, and he actually worked out completely uh, by himself what I will say is the actual frame is this uh, it is it is backwards because obviously he's writing forwards on the screen but we're seeing the behind of the screen so all you have to do is flip it horizontally and here you go so I'm gonna tell you what I do know about this and what I don't know because here's the thing I don't think this is fully accurate mathematics. I don't think that this is going to tell me anything, but I just want to tell you what I'm seeing. So it looks like we've got like a wave diagram over here. And it looks, it, it's, I can't really tell you what it looks like. It's some sort of like sine wave um, or something. It, it looks like an oscillation kind of diagram, but I don't think it really has, it, oh, it's a trajectory thing. So I'm think, I think that circle is meaning like the ball at this position is, or has, it follows the formula of this, uh, which is a 45 squared pi. That's, that's not good maths. <laughs> it should be 45 squared a pi. Um, so I don't think that's, um, I don't think this is like accurate maths. Um, but it's cool we got pi in here because obviously pi really relates to trigonometry and sine waves and stuff like that. So that's cool, um, oscillations and things like that. Um, I will say this is probably more on the physics end of maths and I'm not I'm not the greatest at that. I do have an A level in physics uh, and I have A levels in maths and further maths, but I, I was better at just pure maths than physics. Um, so we've got some summations here, some sigmas. Um, so basically what we're saying is, uh, it's really easy to do with this one. What we're saying is when J is equal to one, uh, we're going to put j equal to 1. Basically, this, this is a summation formula. So we take kj minus 1 and we sum it for every j from 1 to a minus 1. Don't think this is going to do anything. Um, I can't even tell what's really going on here. This looks like um, a position in space. So like a 3D position because there's th there seems to be three coordinates. It's this big summation formula and then there's an a coordinate and a b coordinate. Uh, so that's almost your x, y, z. Uh, 6 p.m. end. What on earth? Yeah, this is, I think this is BS to be honest. Uh, we've got square root of t equals 2 times x squared plus d squared to the power of a half over v, I think that is. 
So when you put something to the power of a half, it's the same as doing uh, a square root around it. So this is essentially two times the square root of x squared plus d squared, uh, which, I, which I recognize as Pythagorean theorem. So if you square all of this, it's going to be four times this over v squared. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I think this is just kind of v equals Wendy variable. That's funny. t equals four hours. What? What do you mean t equals four hours? Don't tell me it took four hours to throw the ball in. It, what I find interesting is this line down at the bottom where you've got tf. So obviously time uh, at f seconds or whatever is equal to the initial time a times one plus a oh, v over c or something. C is the speed of light, by the way. <laughs> speed of light. Just like how it, uh, in equals mc squared, that's speed c is the speed of light. Um, and then over here, u is original velocity. So u times v squared. This isn't accurate math, I don't think. Uh, has he done this correct? v squared one plus a. I don't think this is... Yeah, there's nothing I can get out of this. Uh, sorry guys, I've disappointed you on this one, but uh, maybe I'll look into it more if there is actually something there, but I think it's literally just like, um, I think it's literally Alex Harsh going up to a mathematician and being like, can you please like put some cool formulas and stuff here, um, just so it looks mathsy, but uh, I don't think this is actually going to tell me anything. So, very cool nevertheless, I love all the symbols I'm seeing here. Uh, this sort of thing excites me in these sorts of shows because I love, I love, uh, I'm such a nerd with this sort of thing, but um, let's continue on to the next thing on the agenda because I'm sure you don't want to hear me talking about math for the next half hour. Okay, so the next thing, and this is something that I'm really, really curious about. So, it's this is a hypothesis, and if it's wrong, maybe this won't even go in the final video, <laughs> to be honest, but I, it's just a hypothesis. And basically we saw in, um, okay, let me, let me begin with this. As I've been saying a lot of the time, this show is freaking amazing at foreshadowing. Um, it will set up something right at the beginning of an episode or of the series and it will it will seem completely unrelated to most of the episode and then you get to the end of the episode and you realize that it's what was called out at the beginning of the episode i've done it a few times actually during the reactions just like in the time traveling episode itself it said like stan said um this this uh Dunkle the Grunkle or whatever, Gr Grunkle Dunkle, the, the dunking game. He said that, huh, this is so rigged. And Seuss was like, yeah, unless someone pulls out a futuristic laser gun. And then at the end of the episode, a futuristic laser gun, gun comes out from the TVA stand-ins. So basically a lot of things are foreshadowed right at the beginning to kind of, um, well, to, to foreshadow things at the end. So what I'm thinking is because now We've met this time traveler, Blendon Blandin, and we've seen that he has gone to places in previous episodes. I wonder, I wonder, wonder, wonder if he was actually in any of the uh, previous episodes. So I'm going to have a look. Now, what I will say is I really hope this is true. Um, like, you have no idea how much I want this to be true, because if it is true, then it's ridiculously cool that the show is able to do this sort of thing. Um, so he's not there, I don't think. Although, do we even recognize? I think those are just like tourists uh, coming to the mystery shack. Uh, that's Mabel's boyfriend. Ah, oh, this is this is nostalgic, funnily enough. There are some runes in the back there, by the way, that I haven't noticed. Uh, also, an Egyptian cloak in the back? What? I, I didn't even realize. Um, I didn't even realize half of this. So this is where he finds the book. It is weird that it's kind of down there. Anyway, let's not think too hard about it. Uh, once again, we haven't, we, we seem to miss a lot because we, oh, we haven't even looked at this. It's hard to believe it's been six years since I began searching the strange and wondrous secrets of Gravity Falls, Oregon. In all my travels, uh, never have I observed so many curious things. Gravity Falls is indeed a geographical oddity. Six years. Six years ago. Huh. I'm also wondering what these numbers are at the bottom. I'd assume they're nothing, but... Uh, just a thought. Oh, this is cool. I cannot wait to get this book. Obviously, I'm going to do that once the two seasons are over. But this book seems like it just has so much in it and I can't wait to dissect it with you guys. Um, so, beans in the background. Uh, <laughs> normal guy. Uh, maybe if I go back to... Oh, that's probably it. No, oh no, yeah, yeah, okay. 
It's gonna be, if it, if it's a thing, it's gonna be when there's the giant no monster. Because that's when we saw blending. Um, in, in that, oh, let me have a look. I think it's probably later on. So it, it's around here and I would love to kind of go through this frame by frame, but he, he has to be here somewhere. Okay, that's just, okay, that's not happening. Oh my God, that was a cool, that, that was a cool shot there. Oh, uh, Fraser, <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe it's better if I do this in Premiere Pro. Cause you know, <gasps> That's so cool. That's so cool. Look, he's in the background. <laughs> oh my God. That's sick. Oh my God. I mean, it makes sense why we didn't notice that before. Because he looks, he, he's blending in with the rocks. He's blending in. Oh my gosh, I made that without even thinking about it. Made that joke without even thinking about it. Um, but wow, so we just completely missed him. So is he doing anything? He's, I think he's just still in the background. Yeah, he, and, and he ducks down. Uh, he's picking up the calculator or whatever it is. That's insane. As I say, foreshadowing is insane in this. Um, let's look at episode two. So I think episode two should be a little bit easier because he was on like the port area and we only see that really once in the episode and that's like right at the beginning. So he goes through here. So where, he, he must be here. Oh my God, it's Lazy Susan. I didn't even realize she was, oh my gosh. This is the thing. I think once we watch this show, we're ironically gonna have to do a rewatch of the show because there's gonna be so many things here that we didn't even realize we missed. And the reason that we are missing these things is because we, it's the reporter guy. Since when? Okay. Yeah, the reason we're missing all of these things is because we just don't know the, like the context. This is, this is Wendy's family. Like it makes sense now, they're all ginger. <laughs> um, but there we go. He must be around here, I think. Is he in the background? So we know he's going to be in the background. We know that. Uh, Dippy. I mean, obviously he's not going to be in the foreground because otherwise we would have seen him earlier, it, like during the episodes. Oh, come on. It, 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 it's at this moment when, when he starts to go crazy. Uh, we, we, it, it must be here. Oh my freaking God. What? What on earth? That's crazy. This is really cool. It's the thing about this is it's always really creepy when this sort of thing happens. Or at least I get the chills because it means that I've been watching the show and I just haven't been paying enough attention because there's there's probably stuff going on in the background that I I have not even clocked. Um Wow. So he's literally just stood there. And and of course the reason why we missed this is because this is the part where he slaps the sandwich, right? <laughs> we just saw him. Oh, wow. We saw him pick up the calculator and then the camera changes, the camera angle changes and he's gone. That's because he's, he's blending in with the surroundings or he's, he's time traveled back to the future, uh, back to the future reference. Uh, <laughs> That's so cool. This this is amazing. Uh, there should be one more episode where he appears. So let's have a look at that. And this one is going to be during this presentation with the wax figure Grunkle. Uh, the grand reopening of the wax museum of mystery. So he should be here somewhere in the background. Uh, okay. All right, Dipper and Wendy are talking. Is he here? 
he where, where he was before in the in the episode with him in like properly he was in the background while uh, the old man was talking the crazy man was talking um, McGucket oh my god Gravity Falls is the greatest show I've ever seen this stuff is blowing my mind how have I missed this it's so obvious it's so obvious. Let's let's watch this scene real quick. Old man McGucket, local kook, are the wax figures alive? And follow-up question: Can I survive the wax man uprising? Uh. As I said, insane. How did we miss that? It's so freaking obvious. <laughs> it's so crazy obvious. Oh my god. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> There's, there's the three episodes. Oh, that's crazy. That's so cool. Um, I love that. Um, I love the creators of the show. Like, genuinely, they, they put their heart into this. You can really tell. Um, especially, like, compared to other shows. I'm not going <laughs> to pull other shows down. But, like, compared to other shows, this show has such a huge attention to detail. And, um, actually... One of my favourite shows um, of all time, uh, and I've mentioned this in Gravity Falls uh, reactions multiple times, is Bojack Horseman. If you're a fan of Gravity Falls, um, you might be a fan of Bojack. Um, I think Bojack is for more um, mature audiences, um, but it's a similar style animation, and there's not like secret codes or like a secret lore at all really. But the thing you'll find in BoJack Horseman is they make so many funny jokes in every episode. Some of the episodes are literally just one episode long joke, right? Um, and <laughs> the thing about BoJack is it's got a really, really deep story behind it. Um, it's about like fame and um, what people do to themselves when they get famous and think they have loads of power and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's just, it's really, really sick, and I'm getting the same vibes with Gravity Falls, where you have secret things in the background, and the, ugh, it's just so cool. Everything about this show is just amazing. I don't really have any complaints about it so far. Um, cool, really good. Ah yeah, so the other thing that I wanted to go through, um, and this probably wasn't the right wording for it, locations in his clothes, oops, uh, but basically, in the episode where we first see Blendon Blandon, his his clothes change um, change like material, uh, change scenery. It's a bit weird, bit of a weird way to describe it, but like I want to see what those scenes are. So here is the first time we see Blendon, or technically the fourth time that we see Blendon, but uh, we won't talk about that. So that's just like Gravity Falls uh, foresty area. Uh, that is, is that on the lake, um, the, like, the Butt Island Lake, maybe? Uh, and then he goes back to normal. Or he goes invisible. Uh, and then later on, when they're talking, when he's talking to Dipper and Mabel here, we'll see, he turns into, like, a broken screen. Oh, where is it? Okay, so here we go. He's gonna change. So he changes to, like, the TV monitor broken screen sort of thing. Um, I don't actually know what that's called. What is that called, guys? Oh, that's that's Butt Island, 100%. That's Butt, Butt Island, right? So that's a reference to episode two. Great. That, that's a dinosaur. There's a dinosaur there. But it looks like we haven't seen that area before. So maybe in a future episode, we'll see that. And I, to be honest, like, it, it sounds weird, but it sounds, like, really obvious. Um, time Traveller, like, this is probably showing us the future of the series. Because he's a time traveller, he, he might show us some future things. So, that's interesting that we, we might see more dinosaur kind of content later. Uh, potentially, anyway. And then, this is what I saw in the reaction video is he switches to Arcade, which is the next episode in the series. So that's really, really sick that he does that. Uh, and then he switches back. 
Okay, uh, and I don't think there's any more times where he he changes clothing in a way. So, really, really cool stuff. I'm, I'm loving all of these references that I'm picking up on. All right, in that same episode, I'm telling you, th this episode that we keep going back to, this Time Travelers episode, just kind of blew my mind in so many ways, and that's why it's my favorite episode. So, in this episode, and I didn't call it out in my reaction, and it's because I was mainly confused. But we go back to the past, they drop the calculator, they go back to here, they go back to Butt Island or whatever. It's really cool that this, this happens. Uh, see, this is, this is there. Cool. I love that shot, it's so cool. But then, then we get a really random place. So they're in like a snowy area. Oh no, I think they, they transport to a snowy area. And... Yeah, and... Oh, okay. I get it now. So this is the same... Um, this looks the same as the Mystery Shack. This looks like maybe it's uh, far in the past. Um, it, it's a Mystery Shack before it became the Mystery Shack, in a way. Uh, and it's snowy, so it's a winter, I would assume. Or it's just like a completely different cabin, but I don't see why they do that. And then, who pops out this door? I mean, if, okay, if you look right at the back, we've got this kind of painting, and I've seen that before, because I've I've almost called attention to it, because it almost looks like a king on a, on a crescent moon, so maybe it's like a moon king, like a sun, sun god, moon god sort of thing. Um, so it seems like it is the same same shack as the mystery shack, and then this guy comes out, and I'm I'm pretty sure it's Grunkle. It it, it has to be like a younger version of Grunkle. Uh, I didn't call that out in the episode because I was just really confused because it looks like Grunkle, but it 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 doesn't. Um, maybe it's because of the beard uh, and the fact that he has brown hair instead of grey. Uh, this this has to be Grunkle. It just seems like a really weird place to put this and he, he also doesn't say anything like this is just a really weird addition to the episode because it's it's not it's not funny <laughs> it doesn't give us any law really and it's just kind of put here really um it like he doesn't even interact with Dipper and Mabel or anything so it, it's just like really kind of out of place in a way so that's something I just wanted to point out that I didn't actually point out in my reaction itself uh, neither the cut or uncut reactions, but um, yeah, I, it seems like we we have a young Stan character. I wonder if we will go back to the past again and see him again. Maybe this is setting up something again, like the foreshadowing thing. Uh, it, it's setting up something in the future. Uh, I can see that definitely happening. Um, but it just seemed out of place, so I just wanted to point that out. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is the chess game which was in episode, the epi the Little Dipper episode. So let's have a look at that. All right, so it's almost right at the beginning. It's after the intro here. Okay, so they're playing chess. Little Guide to Black Space Nine. It's a pawn. Little Guide to Black Space Nine? That is not a real... Black Space Nine? It's not a real call out, by the way. I do know chess lore. And, oops, that was weird. I do know chess law. Uh, and when I say chess law, I mean I, I know how to play chess and I'm relatively okay at it. Uh, but what I'm what I'm seeing here, you know what, I'm gonna take a screenshot and like try and analyze this properly. So the first thing to point out is this is not an accurate chess board. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, it, so a chessboard is not eight by ten. Uh, a chessboard is square, it is an eight by eight chessboard. You have the rooks and you have the bishops and knights, uh, not in that order. <laughs> I'm making it more difficult for myself. Um, so it's an eight by eight, so this isn't an accurate chessboard, so I can't really tell you the position and stuff, plus Mabel is putting a pawn on a black square where there's already a white pawn, which doesn't 
that's not a legal move. So, and, and plus, where is she even moving that pawn from? Would she be moving it from her first, uh, like, first row? Because if so, why was the pawn on the first row in the first place? So that doesn't really make sense. I, I also really like here that there are two rooks of opposite colors on the back row. Like, I think the obvious move for white right now would be to take this rook with your rook and then you would be checking the the king. Although actually your queen would be um, in danger. Sorry, I'm, I'm really rambling. This has got nothing to do with the law. I don't know why I even tried to look into this. Let's move on to the next thing. I will say this is because I'm a FNAF theorist. <laughs> I look into every little detail. When I see something that I like the look of, then I will take it and I will try to get some sort of law out of it because that's how FNAF theorists do things. Um, so let's look at uh, one by six. So Stan's tattoo. It's a blue tattoo and it's got a circle and an arrow pointing to the right. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> Unfortunately, another dead end. Uh, let's keep moving. Ah, uh, really quickly, I just want to do one by eight. So that is Irrational Treasures. Now, I recall that in Irrational Treasure, there was a uh, there was a line in this Northwest cover-up uh, document that Dipper was reading, and it was about a baby in a in a ice cube in a glacier. Here we go. An enormous, evil, time-devouring baby from another dimension is frozen in an Antarctic glacier. Fortunately, glaciers never melt, so we should be fine. <laughs> Writing jokes for cartoons is more important than sleep. Um, so, if you haven't pieced that together, which I, I pieced this together uh, outside the episode, um, that is most likely referring to the time traveling baby at like the end of time with the TVA who is shooting lasers from its eyes, who has the um, hourglass on its forehead. Um, so it seems like they found him uh, frozen in an Antarctic glacier, but eventually at some point he has to make it out because we see that in the far future. Uh, very cool, I like that. So the final thing that I wanna go through today is a little bit more bear law, okay? When I say bear law, you may not know what on earth I'm talking about. But essentially, I worked out that uh, before, the, before the big reveal, uh, that Dipper, uh, the name Dipper stems from the Big Dipper, which is a asterism, an asterism, uh, a constellation, uh, and it's like a, a Dipper, like a set of stars that look like a, a saucepan or something. Um, and basically, uh, we, we saw that on his forehead as well. So it's kind of confirmed that that's where his name has come from. Uh, it's his birthmark. It's almost like it was destiny, which kind of ties into astronomy, uh, astrology and stuff like that. Um, and then we got an episode called Little Dipper. So we got the Big Dipper and we got Little Dipper. Turns out that Little Dipper is also an asterism, just like the Big Dipper. And both the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper have alternate names called Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, I think it is. Basically, I want to look more into what Ursa Major is. Uh, oh, interesting. So I'm looking at this diagram now. And what I'm seeing... Let me see, let me see. Okay, I get it, I get it. So what I'm seeing is we've got the Big Dipper here, and that's only a part of Ursa Major, okay? And this is apparently, that's apparently why it's a bear. Uh, I, I do not see that at all, but you can kind of see the Big Dipper here, right? You can see, you can see the constellation there. Cool. Um, and then let's have a look at Ursa Minor, which is this. Uh, Oh, okay, so Ursa Minor is literally only, um, only the bear. So there's, it's not like part of us. Uh, there we go, here it is. Ursa, uh, she not really. 
But there you go, it seems like um, we have the Big Dipper and Little Dipper in a way, and both are tied to bears. Um, so what does that mean? Because obviously we had the multi-bear, the multi-bear in the Dipper versus Manliness episode. So it seems like Dipper is connected to bears in some way. Obviously he had a connection to, a, to the bears quite literally because of um, the universe's stand-in for Dancing Queen by ABBA. Um, Dancing Queen. Feel the beat from the tambourine, oh yeah. Dipper versus manliness. So, here's what I find interesting is, is a lot of the time we're getting uh, names of episodes uh, with Dipper's name in it. Dipper versus manliness, we find out he has a connection to bears or he, like, a, like an emotional connection almost. Uh, he's sort of paralleling a bear or whatever. Episode number seven is called Double Dipper. In that episode, we find out he has a birthmark on his forehead, which is the Big Dipper. Episode 11 is called Little Dipper, which is in its own right, a constellation. So it seems like every episode with Dipper in, its, in the title name kind of has a relation to bears, which I don't know if that's a, a coincidence or not, but if it is a coincidence, then that's a pretty big coincidence. Maybe I'm stretching too far because again, I'm a FNAF theorist. We tend to do that a lot of the time, but it's very interesting that there could be some sort of connection to bears here. What do I think that could mean? I have no idea, to be honest. Um, maybe it could be, <laughs> maybe later on <laughs> we find out that he's actually a bear. Uh, I don't know why I said that, it's such a stupid, freaking prediction um i don't know okay you know what i think that's enough analyzing and theorizing for one day um we got a lot of things um looked at in this episode and i genuinely cannot believe we found uh, the time traveler in multiple places in previous episodes that's just so cool to me but also it's good to note that we we have some potential suspects for who is the author of the book, and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with, um, with my kind of analysis on that. And we're going to see as time goes on if that turns out to be correct. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching once again. Another reaction video will be coming very very soon. So I'll see you in that one. Goodbye. <laughs>